Good morning. I'm Associate Chancellor for Public Affairs, Robin Kaler, and I'll be your moderator for today's town hall. It's just a few minutes after 1130, and I know there are still people trying to connect, but we're going to go ahead and get started to make sure we get to as many questions as possible today. Welcome to the University of Illinois Alumni Association's virtual town hall featuring Illinois Chancellor Robert Jones. This is the UIAA's third installment in its virtual town hall series, and the Alumni Association hopes you will join them for future town hall events as well. If at any point during the call today you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please press star three on your telephone keypad. We do expect a lot of participants today and a lot of questions, so let's get right to it. I'll start off by inviting Chancellor Jones to offer a few introductory remarks, and then we'll move into the questions and the conversation. So let's get started. <coughs> My great pleasure to introduce Robert Jones, the 10th Chancellor of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Chancellor Jones, thank you for joining this conversation with our Illinois alumni family. Thank you, Robin, for the opportunity to participate in this town hall. Uh, let me start by first of all saying uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whichever is applicable uh, to all of our alumni that are participating. And secondly, to thank the University of Illinois Alumni Association for hosting this town hall. You know, it is always wonderful to have the opportunity to interact with our alumni family. So we've been really looking forward to this event. And thanks to all of you who have made the time to call in and to listen today. I know these days of stay at home orders and social distances that really meant that many of us are spending much, much more time on phones and in front of computer screens. And so I truly appreciate what it means uh, to ask you to, for you to voluntarily participate in another of our of search virtual engagement. Let me start by just reminding each and every one of us, we are a university with more than 152 years of historic momentum. But on March 23rd, 2020, the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic brought an unexpected and an unwelcome addition to Illinois history. That was the day that we opened the final half of our spring semester with the unprecedented transition of our entire academic operation in a space of just about 12 to 14 days, we moved entirely from face-to-face -face instruction to an alternative form of delivery that allowed our students to be able to continue their academic studies remotely. And just as the entire world has been working to respond to COVID-19 pandemic, our university has been intensely focused on taking steps to keep our students, our faculty, and our staff safe. That is our primary guiding principle as we navigate our way through this pandemic. We have been in constant communication with our community during the past few weeks, and we are constantly posting updated information and announcement on covid19.illinois.edu. I really would encourage you to visit this site to learn more about our decisions and our actions. And of course, we will continue to be updating it daily because it really is the central point of information about the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in this time. Our campus is a much quieter place today than I think has ever been in the history of the university. We are following the guidance of CDC and public health experts to take any possible steps to reduce the density of our campus population and to allow for a greater distance since distancing and greater safety for anyone who remains on our campus. To give you some sense of the things that we've had to do, we've asked our students to return to their permanent home for the rest of the semester if they could. We allow students who could not safely return to stay in university housing where they have access to services and support that they need to continue their studies. And we have asked the majority of our faculty and our staff to find ways to continue to do their work remotely. And we have implemented temporary policies to make it as easy as possible for them to do so. 
This is just a partial list of the enormous impact of COVID-19 here in Illinois. And in the space of about two weeks, we went from a campus with about 70,000 people present each and every day to one now that has about 1,000 people on site on a given day. And most of these 1,000 people are what we call essential employees that are trying to keep core parts of our university's operation intact. In our local communities, we are grateful that our number, the number of cases remain fairly low. But our thoughts must also be with the families who have been touched by COVID-19. The health experts tell us that this will, in many ways, uh, get worse before it gets better. And I certainly hope that we have seen the worst of it and things will continue to improve. And that will mean that there will be more cases, more impact on our students, our faculty, and our staff, and those folks that we call our friends and our supporters. Unfortunately, as we talk today, we are still very much in the middle of this pandemic. And there's continued uncertainty and disruption. And while we have found a way to compete this year and deliver our educational promise that we made to students, there is nothing remotely normal about any of this. This is tremendously hard and stressful for our students. And on a daily basis, we're asking our faculty and staff to reinvent their jobs and their work. But we'll get through this. As my granny used to say, this too will pass. And we are planning carefully and thoughtfully for the future as we navigate through this pandemic and how we must be a different shape university structurally and operationally than we were before the pandemic started. But we still will remain one of the great research universities in the world. This is, a critically, this is critically important, important, folks, because the world would need the university more than ever before when this pandemic is behind us. And I can tell you one of our core commitments is to be better prepared for the next pandemic. And we've always been a place, I think you would agree, that shows the world the best solution to the hardest problems or found when we all come together. That is what we've been doing here at the University of Illinois at Bennett Champaign through this crisis. And I am very, very confident it is what you will see from your university in the weeks and the months and the years to come. So with that, Robin, I will end my comments here and I'll ask Robin to get us started with the rest of the conversation. Again, thank you for participating. Thank you, Chancellor Jones, and I'll just remind everyone on the call that you can kind of virtually raise your hand to ask a question at any time by pressing star three on your phone keypad. That will put you in a queue, and one of our Alumni Association staff members will get to you as soon as they can. Chancellor Jones, you just talked a little bit about how challenging and stressful this time has been for everybody, but I also know we often find a crisis brings out the very best in people. Can you tell us what you've seen from the university community during this pandemic that's made you especially proud or excited? Well, it's very, very clear that these are very, very difficult times in which we live. Uh, the entire world is facing something that it's never faced before. But I can tell you, I've always been impressed with our faculty and our staff and our students and our, and our lungs. But I'm even more impressed with these folks uh, as we have navigated this crisis uh, in the face of a lot of hardship and it makes me extremely proud to be a part of a university where people have come together. They are protecting themselves as well as protecting others. And uh, every day, there's not a day that goes past that something doesn't happen or some discussion or some big idea that comes from our faculty and staff and students uh, doesn't come to the table to help shape not only how the university is navigating this. I'm proud of the fact that we played a role in helping other higher education institutions across the state in the country think differently and more strategically about navigating this crisis. And uh, we have helped the state of Illinois 
through the brilliant work of our fa- faculty better prepare for this pandemic. So there's a lot to be proud of, and uh, we will continue to work together as we transition uh, during this pandemic. And uh, we just very, very grateful to be a part of a community that has people that are so inspirational and so um, just so willing to not sit and complain, but really to work hard to find solutions, because that's what we do at Illinois. Thank you very much. Um, so we have quite a few people who actually tuned in or, or turned on, whatever you want to call it, before we uh, even began um, and submitted some questions on the web. And so I'd like to take one of those first. Um, Susan had asked, what is the plan for in-person classes this fall, and when will a decision be made about that? Well, the plan for this fall is uh, that we are working toward a plan where we hope to be able to resume face-to-face instruction in the fall. But however, we're also looking at a number of contingency plans just in case uh, that is not allowed to occur because of uh, the continued uh, peak in the number of cases or death or other circumstances that would call the state of Illinois or health officials to tell us that that's not the prudent thing to do. But I can tell you, uh, we do fundamentally believe that the residential experience is a critically important part of the growth and development of our students. And it is the fundamental basis for a public higher education, for a public research university. And notwithstanding all of that, as I said earlier, the health and safety of our students and our faculty and our entire community is our main concern. So we uh, have to plan. We have to make some assumptions. And the assumption is that we will do all we can to return in the fall. And we need to do this in a timely fashion because families need to have the opportunity to plan for fall term. And so we will know definitely whether we will resume classes and face-to-face or if there will be some kind of hybrid version where maybe some classes online, some instruction face-to-face and our critical timeline for making this decision in order to allow families to plan will be probably sometime in the middle of June. Great. Thank you so much. And now we're going to actually uh, go to the callers. We're going to give this a try, see how we can do this. Um, Vladimir has been waiting to ask a question. Um, Let's see here. Vladimir, if I can get you to come on live. Let's see here. Oh, can, uh, can we hear Vladimir now? Let's see. It looks like James is live. Oh, okay. Let's see here. Um, Let's let's. uh, You know what? I can't. I don't think I can get to that one. James, is that James? Is that you? This is James Lewis. Hi, James. Are you the one asking about the library? Yes, I am. Okay. Why don't you go ahead and give your question to the chancellor, and then we'll drive Vladimir next. Thank you. Okay. So I'm a lifetime alumni and a a donor to the library, and I was wondering how how the coronavirus has impacted operations in the library and how are you planning to deal with it in the future for your future planning for this pandemic Mm -hmm. and for the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Go ahead, Chancellor. As you said, that's a very specific question, but I think Chancellor can give you the the, – sort of the the parameters that we use to to keep people safe. So go ahead, Chancellor. Right, right. Uh, James, thanks so much for the question. And uh, we uh, appreciate your commitment and your support of our library. As you probably have to know better than anyone, our library is uh, one of the important resources, not only for this university, the state, uh, and the nation, and for the world. And just like every other academic and academic support portion of our uh, function, we uh, had to move the staff to remote work. Uh, but our library will uh, continue to be an important asset for our students. And uh, as we 
start to try to transition back to on-site operation, our library resources, as well as uh, many of the other core academic functions will probably be one of the first entities that we transition back, primarily be if we're going to have instruction in the fall, the library has to be a, a critical asset uh, that we uh, that we re-engage with. Uh, but I'd like to also say that uh, that we have a significant number of materials that are available online. So even though the library may not be physically open, you can still access materials electronically. And um, we are currently planning, as I said earlier, for the process of, of institutionalizing a process or implementing a process for individual access to materials that people need for their research uh, work as well. Uh, so it's critical asset, and uh, as you may know, hopefully post this crisis, there are some very exciting plans that I'm sure you're aware of about uh, capital projects that are going to profoundly impact our library, our main library, as well as the historic library that's in Oak Hill Hall. So critical asset, and uh, uh, we are very, very proud of the work that has done in the past and the role it's going to play, play in helping us to transition back to face-to-face -face operation. Great. Thank you, Chancellor. And next, let's try to, let's try to see if we can get to Vladimir again. Uh, Let's see here. Hey. Hmm. Are you there, Vladimir? Can you hear me? We sure can. Ask your question for Chancellor Jones, please. Hey, uh, I had a couple questions, but I'll just ask the first one. Um, I'm just curious on what the school is doing uh, to help uh, students with any financial hardships that they have to adhere. Now, I understand nobody could have predicted this, uh, or at least to this uh, atmosphere or to this um, level. Uh, but what is the school doing to kind of help students with financial hardships that have to not only study, but also study at home with, you know, numerous of distractions, but also not being able to maybe uh, pay for school or anything like that, or other uh, things that, you know, uh, if they have jobs on campus or sort, uh, that sort of thing. Is the school doing anything like that to help the students? Thank you. Well, we, uh, thanks. Thanks a lot, Vladimir. We've been doing a lot in this regard um, because we know that this uh, pandemic has really disrupted families uh, emotionally and financially. So there were students that we had admitted to this university. We'd already packed a financial aid, and we've established a process by which they can. Uh, resubmit the FAFSA, FAFSA and uh, other kinds of documents uh, because if there's a change in their financial income, we know this will impact the amount of financial aid that they uh, may be available for. And at the very, even before the pandemic, we went to offsite education. The first thing we did was to make sure that Students from underrepresented backgrounds, from students from uh, all parts of the country, or state, or from the country who maybe be in or in communities where there wasn't good uh, computer access or Wi-Fi access, or maybe they didn't have the appropriate kind of computers. We mailed computers and we sent software and uh, Wi-Fi connection, internet access to students around the country. And uh, the next thing that we're in the process of rolling out now is that we provided, uh, will be providing, a process of providing additional financial resources through the CARES uh, COVID-19 Emergency Support Fund that's been established where we're going to be uh, providing all in and we have available probably in the excess of about uh, $36 million, maybe as much as $40 million to help support students. And our main goal is to help the neediest students that are part of our community to assure that they have the access that they need to come back to campus. And just in closing, I think, I think it's also important to mention that we have refunded substantial amount of money back to students 
for dormitories that they were no longer allowed to use, for uh, dining fees, for transportation fees. Uh, that's also been one of the ways that we have mitigated uh, the impact of this, this pandemic on our students and their families. And I also like to add that not only did we keep our employees, uh, our full-time employees, uh, on the job, notwithstanding the fact that some of them couldn't report to work uh, uh, because of the nature of their work could not be uh, done remotely. We kept people employed, including our students, and we'll continue to do so to the end of our contract. So we have been really working very, very hard to minimize and mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on our students and their families. And Chancellor, would you want to talk just a little bit about the um, technology issues some of our students have faced and what we've done to help them? The technology issues? The, the students uh, who well, uh, had, had difficulty going, you didn't have computers or that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, I, I mentioned that we mail computers and software to people and uh, provided uh, uh, ability for students to have their own uh, internet connections, their own hotspots. And so we've done a lot in that regard to make sure that, uh, because we were greatly concerned that, you know, you're sending kids back to communities where they may not have some of these assets. And as much as we possibly uh, could, we uh, made sure that people could, uh, that they would be aware of these assets and uh, I don't know the exact number, but I know that many of our students did take advantage uh, for, uh, of this opportunity. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure people caught that because that was, a, it was a, a pretty important thing to not leave anybody behind. Yeah. And again, for those of you who are just now joining us, you're listening to the University of Illinois Alumni Association's Virtual Town Hall featuring Illinois Chancellor Robert Jones. If at any point you'd like to ask a question or make a comment during the discussion, please press star three on your telephone keypad. Um, and Chancellor, now we're going to go to Steve Jones, who is the parent of an engineering student. Um, let's see if we can get Steve live. Steve, are you there? Hmm. Having some difficulty getting him to pop up. There we go. Steve, are you there now? Yes, I am. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm doing wonderful this morning, despite. <laughs> Great. Can, can you ask your question for Chancellor Jones? Oh, we've lost him. I got it. Ah, well, Steve, if you can try calling back in. I guess his question, though, was uh, what we're doing to help students uh, kind of mitigate the stress of finals, is what that said in his, in his chat box. So, Chancellor, can you, can you uh, answer that? Sure. What, what we're trying to do. Well, it's, it's not just mitigating the stress of finals. You know, that's critically important. But all of doing this whole process, we have worked very, very hard to try to provide all kinds of support uh, for our students, uh, not only financially, but to provide that support uh, that's clearly related to their health and, and well-being. Uh, we have uh, created strategies for them to still get access to McKinley Health Services, uh, to deal with any emotional issues that they face. And uh, we have also contracted with uh, outside parties to help us expand our, our capacity to uh, use an app-based approach so people can call in if they're feeling stressed and get some advice in that regard. So we continue to do all the things that we used to do face-to-face, -face, and I think we all would agree, in addition to the normal stressful environment that the educational environment presents here uh, at the University of Illinois, it is even more stressful when it occurs uh, concurrent with, um, you know, with the pandemic. And so since we can't do a lot of this face-to-face, uh, -face, we're doing as much as we possibly can uh, to make sure students and our staff are available of the uh, virtual online access in terms of counseling service and other kinds of uh, opportunities for us to um, 
you know, to, to address this critical need in, in our university at this time. So we wish we could do more, but uh, we have to use the virtual opportunities and tools, and we're using those to the extent that, uh, that we, the full extent of our, of our capability. Great, thank you. Um, and next, I think we're gonna try to go to Annette. Annette, you have a question about commencement? Are you there, Annette? Can you hear us? Hello. Hi, Annette, how are you today? Hi, I am well, how are you all? Great, let's hear your question for Chancellor Jones. Um, Chancellor, uh, my son is a graduating senior from the engineering program and we're out of state. We live here in California. And I mm -hmm. was just wondering if the university has any kind of like special plans for the seniors since obviously there'll be no graduation this year. Um, so regarding commencement or anything like that. Uh, yes, we are have a lot of innovative ideas that we're pursuing. First and foremost, unfortunately, I, I know how disappointing this must be to yourself, to your son, and all of the seniors that are uh, going to be graduating. So what we've done in the meantime is we have a virtual uh, celebration that is planned for our graduates, and that's going to occur in a couple of weeks on May 16th. And we've also created Facebook uh, events for everyone that uh, wants to participate. So this is going to be a virtual graduation with, uh, with confetti and a whole bunch of the things that you would normally see in a face-to-face -face graduation. And um, uh, we also are, are trying to uh, make and figure out how do we do the following. I think it's absolutely critical and important for this group of seniors to not be the first group of seniors in our history, I think since uh, one of the wars, to not be able to participate in a more traditional kind of graduation. So assuming that eventually the stay in place order will be uh, lifted and we will be able to schedule an in-person graduation ceremony when we are able to do so safely. And so I know how important it is to our students and how important it is to parents. We don't know exactly when that will be, but whenever the mitigation of this pandemic is such that we can safely do so, this is a commitment that we've made, and we're very, very excited to have this group of students today both have a virtual graduation and a more traditional graduation. And in some ways, we're very, very excited about the ability, at least our commitment, to try to do both. Great. Thank you so much, Chancellor. Uh, let's see. Next, we are going to go to Beth. Let's see here. Beth? Yes. Uh, Beth, can you hear us? Great. Uh, yeah. so what's your chance for the Chancellor today? Um, I have a question about summer programs. Um, my son is a high schooler and hopefully a future alumni. My husband and I are both alumni, and he's been waiting to hear about a summer engineering program. Given everything that's going on, they haven't really made a decision on if and, what, and how that program might move forward. I was curious what your plans were for the summer. <clears throat> Well, I, I think hopefully you've heard by now that all summer courses uh, have been moved uh, as well to the uh, alternative delivery system uh, because of uh, the pandemic. And uh, we canceled study abroad opportunities as well for the rest of the summer. We've canceled summer camps and those type of things. So, um, I assume that part of what you were saying is that maybe the internship may have been off-site. And so for those programs, we don't have a lot of direct control of, over, but I think because of COVID-19, it was virtually impossible because we didn't, wouldn't have time to adequately plan for our traditional summer curriculum. A few, a few uh, weeks ago, we made the decision uh, it was a difficult decision, but we think it was the right decision in view of our absolute commitment to keep our students safe, uh, to cancel all, all summer uh, courses and related summer programs. 
uh, it's unfortunate, but we certainly hope that he'll be able to uh, still take advantage of this important learning opportunity that we know full well is a very important part of, uh, um, you know, getting a degree. And, and hopefully, um, I think you said he was a senior, so he's graduating. But, um, you know, I, I certainly wish him well, and I know he's going to have an amazing career or amazing, whether that's going into the workplace or on to graduate study. But uh, that's the decision we had to make uh, in consideration of the health and safety for every member of our, our, our university community. Thank you, Chancellor. And next, we're going to go to um, Mike, uh, who has a question uh, about uh, financial issues. Mike, are you there? I am. Great. Uh, go right ahead. Chancellor, in, in the face of the significant outflow of funds from the university for all the reasons, what actions, if any, are being taken to try to reduce costs currently and going forward to try to operate more financially efficient? Right. Uh, thank you very much for the question. And I let me start by saying uh, we've had a longstanding program, what we call operational excellence at Illinois, where we've been, and even in the best of times, we've been very, very cognizant and concerned about uh, cost. How do we reduce cost, increase efficiency? And so we are embarking on a process that will allow us to uh, really focus and double our efforts in that regard. Um, as we uh, prepare to potentially move back to face-to-face -to -face and prepare for the unknown now regarding what the financial situation of the state might be as we deal with the reality that at this juncture, we've lost north of $70 million in terms of what the cost of COVID-19 has been so far. So we are meeting almost on a weekly basis uh, with my team, my chief financial officer and the provost, uh, trying to do some projections regarding the impact, the additional impact that COVID-19 will have, has had up until this point, and will have perhaps for the rest of the academic year. Um, when I ask this question, I always think it's important, and I try to remind people that uh, I know a number of universities have taken very clear and definitive measures in this regard, and we are doing our own analysis. But a lot of those decisions, and I think sometimes uh, you have to realize that each university is in its own geographical area, faces its own set of financial circumstances. And so we are doing everything that you suggested. We're playing out different financial scenarios, different ways to mitigate what the known of COVID-19 on our financial operation and preparing for what might be uh, the scenario if we are not able to resume in the fall and we have to stay online, what that's going to look like financially and operationally. But at the core of all of this, our core concern is the health and safety of our campus. We're also concerned about the physical health of all of our units. And uh, we're doing everything you could think of, tuition modeling and evaluating different scenarios about what the impact might be on the state. And I'd just like to remind you, so we're, we're very, very thoughtful and um, about how we make these decisions. We don't want to, you know, say the sky is falling and make kind of draconian decisions that may not reflect the financial reality. But I remind you, we have plenty of experience in this regard. Unless you forget, we went 25 months without a budget. And so this university has demonstrated great expertise in addressing budgetary challenges. And one of the things that attracted me to come here four years ago, because it was very, very clear to me that the university probably was at the top of its class using sound financial management strategies across the entire university. And I can assure you that we will continue to do that. And that is one of the core guiding principles and operational issues that we are trying to resolve 
and hopefully in the next few weeks or uh, or so, we will have greater clarity about the possible financial levers or triggers that it will allow us to decide, you know, what other measures we might have to implement. But great question. One of the top things that kind of keeps me up at night and one of the things that my team spends a lot of time running different scenarios to make sure that once we have a complete set of data, we'll be able to make the best decision possible for the benefit of the University of Illinois as alums, as students, and faculty and staff. Great. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, another uh, question that came in from the web, uh, an alum, alumna named Lynn Klein is asking, many of us who are alums give back to very specific university entities. During this crisis, are there focused areas of giving that would help the university students, faculty, and other things? Can you talk a little bit more about the, uh, the whole Illinois CARES? Yes, uh, one of the things that, you know, you know, and again, that's one of the things that makes me uh, so proud to be proud of this university, because notwithstanding the fact that we took the um, roughly uh, 32 million or so from uh, the Federal CARES Act and combine our own resources to try to mitigate the financial impact of, of COVID-19 on our students. It was gratifying how many alums like yourself posed this question. We know the university is dealing with this enormous operational and financial crisis. What can we do to help? And a lot of that is targeted. What can we do to help the students? And so as a part of our um, uh, our uh, Illinois CARES effort, there is a strategy uh, where you can actually donate. You can actually provide financial resources to help mitigate the cost and the impact of uh, COVID-19. And uh, it's called our Illinois CARES COVID-19 Emergency Support Fund. And you can go to our website. You can find details about that. And our goal there is to add to that about $36 million fund that we have to raise additional funds, hopefully in the excess of additional $4 million or so, to be able to direct those resources directly to the most neediest students not only undergraduate students, but graduate students as well, because all of our students that are pursuing education at this university are having a significant, uh, COVID-19 is having a significant impact on their, their bottom line. So that's one of the ways you can get, get involved. And so I would encourage you, if you uh, are able and willing to uh, give to our COVID-19 emergency support fund. And uh, the address, uh, if you are interested, is illinois.edu forward slash, uh, backslash Illinois Cares. And you can go there to learn more and to uh, make a donation. So we appreciate you asking the question, and we really appreciate your thinking about the welfare of our students. Absolutely. Here, here. Again, for those of you just now joining us, you're listening to the University of Illinois Alumni Association's virtual town hall featuring Illinois Chancellor Robert Jones. If you want to ask a question or just make a comment, please press star three on your telephone keypad. And now we are going to go back to the phones. We're going to talk to Rick. Rick, you have a question for Chancellor Jones? Are you there, Rick? I think we're having some trouble hearing Rick, but his question looks like it, he's asking something along the lines of, is the Carl Illinois College of Medicine participating in the drive to find a vaccine for the COVID-19 virus? Chancellor, can you uh, take a stab at that? Sure. Um, let me start by saying um, the entire University of Illinois, not just those that are part of our Carl Illinois College of Medicine, but yeah, every... Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm yes, sorry, we Rick, can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. 
No, go ahead and ask it the way you want to ask it. I'm sorry. Rick, we can't hear you. Oh, oh, are you there, Rick? Yeah, I think Chancellor, let's go ahead and just have you answer it the way you sure. were, you were uh, going. I think that'll be well, close I, enough for us. Was, uh, the answer is yes. Carl Illinois College and Metastone, uh, because the way that our faculty are distributed across many different colleges are very much involved uh, in our effort to uh, find solutions and to mitigate the impact of COVID-19. Um, as, but it's not just the Carl Illinois College of Medicine. It's all of the university in many ways. I uh, think you know that two of our researchers uh, who are experts in modeling the possible outcomes of COVID-19 and epidemiologists, uh, and uh, the other is, a, is a, one of our physics professors who is an expert in modeling uh, pandemics, developed the very early models that I can tell you unequivocally greatly influenced Provost Kangalaris and myself deciding weeks before we executed that it was in the best interest in the health and safety of the university for us to move to uh, away from face-to-face -to, -face to online education. As you probably heard, there were a team of researchers and uh, about 14 people worked for 10 to 14 days uh, to produce a prototype of an emergency ventilator uh, that is designed to help uh, COVID-19 uh, patients, and uh, uh, it's company or entity called Rapid Vent, and this uh, emergency ventilator is in the process of being ma manufactured to assist in the response to, the, to those that might need ventilators. And also, we've helped with designing gowns and masks and face shields and 95 respirators, uh, primarily designed to help uh, protect the health care workforce, those individuals that are on the front line. We're also very proud of the fact that our integrated processing laboratory is making at an industrial level and packaging hand sanitizers, again, to help support Carl Hospital and other hospital system. Our, Extension folks have been out there assisting families and communities during this crisis. And I can tell you one of the things that uh, we also have done and very proud of, we worked very close with Carl Hospital uh, to ramp up the testing capability at Carl. Uh, we have loaned them equipment, loaned them personnel, because I think as you listen to what's going on in the world, you listen to the press conferences, testing, testing, testing is a recurring theme. And in order for us to transition back to face-to-face, -to -face, in order for us to meet our really goal and target of bringing students back in the fall, we have to have very robust testing. So Carl has been an amazing partner in working with the university, combining our strengths and our capabilities to uh, be able to test not only our students, but here in Illinois, we're part of the broader community, Urbana-Champaign, Savoy, and surrounding communities. So we need to not only be able to test our students and our faculty and staff, but we need to be able to test the broader community as well. Great. And Chancellor, I think you might recognize this next caller. Um, Bill, are you on the line now? I'm here. Okay. Can you I, hear me? I think do you recognize this voice, Chancellor Jones? <laughs> oh. Chancellor's Bill Forsyth. <laughs> this is Bill oh, Forsyth. Oh, now I do, of course. Uh, I thought you yeah, somewhat like a, familiar. Hey, Bill. Well, hi. I want to thank you for uh, using the Alumni Association's virtual town hall platform to communicate so effectively with students and parents and alumni from around the world. And I want to say just on behalf of, you know, our over 400,000 alums, I want to congratulate you and your leadership team, uh, not only on how well uh, you reacted and adjusted in real time to the, uh, to the crisis, but equally for how frequently and effectively you kept all of us informed every step of the way. And the question I had for you, I think you just answered it to a degree. I was going to ask you about how important will the availability of testing be in your decision-making process towards bringing, bringing people back? But the other part of the question, which I'm, uh, you, you might have insight on, is 
what metrics are you and the state using to gauge your ability to successfully come back to campus in the fall semester? Right. Well, that's a great question, Bill. First of all, Bill, thank you for your compliments. Um, you know, this is an amazing group of folks at this university who have really stepped up to the plate uh, to kind of redefine in many ways the word uh, what uh, impossible. I mean, we just redefine that each and every day. To answer your question, yes, testing is absolutely critical, and I'll try to be as brief as possible with this. So we're there are three or four main stages to the most pandemics, and what we've been going through for the last six, eight weeks is really phase one, where we're doing the social distancing. We have people working remotely. Malls and gyms are closed, and there are no large gatherings. Restaurants have been closed, and we are for the most part, getting our groceries remotely, and a few of us are still going to the grocery store. But that was all designed to reduce the transmission of the disease. And so where we now are now is I, I believe that we are kind of coming out of this phase that was designed to slow the spread, and we're now approaching the next phase, and that's why some of the decision points or triggers I mentioned earlier become critically important. Because the next phase is going to focus not so much, it's going to shift from community mitigation, social distancing, to case-by-case -case intervention, focusing specifically on identifying those that are infected and through contact tracing, how do we know the people that they've interfaced with. So this is the second phase of this. So the testing becomes absolutely critically important to that. It's critically one important uh, measure to be able to do that for not only for the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign to reopen, but I think for the governor to be comfortable with businesses reopening as well. And, uh, you know, it's virtually impossible to test the whole population, but there are uh, thresholds uh, that many people, I'm not saying this is what the governor is using, but one of the thresholds is is that you need to be able to uh, do testing of 30 out of, out of every 1,000 uh, segment of the population to get some sense of what the population norm is. How many people are actually uh, carrying a disease that may be asymptomatic? And so that's one of the variables that becomes critically important because I think what you're going to find is that uh, it's going to really clarify the number of people in the state of Illinois, Abana Champaign, and the whole U.S. of A that actually have contracted this disease, but maybe asymptomatic versus the very, very unfortunate number of people that have died from it. That clarity is going to be great. But I know another variable that's going to be used, as you constantly hear about, is the number of days where they has not 14 days without a significant number of new cases and hospitalization and trying to make sure that we have enough, uh, that the capacity of uh, ICUs and, and others does not exceed 70%. So those are some of the contemporary measures that I think every entity, including the University of Illinois, the state of Illinois, will be utilizing to decide when and how to kind of start to repopulate and try to get back to what I call the new normal, because it won't ever be back to where it was before this pandemic uh, started to impact all of our lives. So, so that's what we're doing. We're using data-driven strategies, best information from Urbana-Champaign Public Health, the state public health department, our own faculty and staff that do analytical work in this area, and following CDC guidelines. Great, thank you, Chancellor. Um, the next question is uh, is a little more personal. Catherine, sounds like you have a, a very specific question for the Chancellor. Are you there? Yes, I am. Great, go right ahead. Thank you. I am honored that you called me in the state of Michigan. My husband and I are both graduates of the University of Illinois, and between us we have four degrees from the university. Wow. And that university, our university, was part of our life for nine years. Our first child was born at Carl Clinic. I, and it, we were resident students there. 
I cannot imagine what my life would be if I had had not had not had that experience. So the hardest part for me for all of this is is the rug has been yanked out from under my world as I know it. And I want to know, sir, from you personally, what is the hardest thing that you are facing as a president of a premier university? Well, thank you so much, uh, Catherine, for your statement. And it's always gratifying to know the impact that this university has had on the lives of our alums. And uh, and you've got four, uh, I think I heard you say, in one household. So we're very, very proud of that. Um, you know, the biggest issue for me as the chancellor of this university, and, you know, I lived a life that's been replete of having to navigate one crisis or uh, finding a new path to move institutions and communities forward. So in many ways, this is not new, but it's new in the context. There's no playbook here, Catherine. Nobody has really had to do this before. And you're put in a situation where you are really having to make tough decisions sometimes with incomplete information, while at the same time keeping the health and safety of your community at the forefront. So the biggest issue for me is the uncertainty of when will this end and what the ultimate impact and cost is going to be for my university and my university community. That's the part that really makes this very uh, disturbing, but I'm absolutely confident that we will emerge from this hopefully as a better community and a better university and the fundamental understanding that these things are perhaps going to be more a part of our life and our future than perhaps we want and that we better start to prepare ourselves for the next one. But it's the uncertainty. Uh, about the decisions we make. We try to make them using the best data we have at, on hand, but a lot of the decisions that I have to make are based on decisions that public health and other officials and data that influence what we have to do. And so it's the uncertainty that uh, really causes me to great concern. And the second piece, I fundamentally know that there's a significant loss of connection because folks sometimes forget that a part of that amazing educational experience that you and your family received here occurred outside of the formal classroom. The formal classroom is critically important for a debate, for a back and forth discussion of critical issues. It's more difficult to do that online. But a lot of the experience that helped shape who we are as individuals because of a college degree occurs in informal settings. And now all of that is being prevented at the moment. You know, social distancing really doesn't allow that to happen. So those are the two the things that really trouble me most is the uncertainty about when this will end, what it's going to look like on the back end of this, and uh, what will be lost from the inability to continue in our traditional way of interfacing as members of the academic community that also adds value to the educational experience. Well, and I know when this uh, stuff all passes, I want to get in my car and drive to Michigan and give Catherine a hug. That was the sweetest call I think I've ever heard anybody, uh, anybody make. That was, that was delightful. Um, okay, Chancellor, we are now going to go to Franklin. Um, let's see here. Franklin, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Great. What's your question for Chancellor Jones? Okay, Chancellor Jones, I really believe that this um, coronavirus pandemic is um, an act of God. I believe that um, 
the Lord decided that the tuition is way too high at Illinois. There's too much bureaucracy. There's too many people that are paid way too much for doing nothing. And now we can get rid of those people. We can cut the tuition 50% and go online, not only at the University of Illinois, but the Springfield bureaucracy and the federal bureaucracy. I'd like to hear your thoughts as to why we can't go all digital and maybe just have a couple of fraternities on campus for parties. Uh, well, Franklin, that's an interesting perspective, and I think I in part answered uh, your question in response to what I said to Catherine. Uh, first and foremost, an important part of the educational experience occurs outside both in the classroom because of the dynamics that occurs between students and uh, faculty. And we have really shifted our whole instructional facility to be more discussion-based. The contemporary classroom is not a classroom where the professor is standing there pontificating in 55 or 50-minute intermits. Uh, in, uh, inter -intermits. Uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> 55 minute section. And so uh, there's a lot of dynamic that occurs uh, in the face to face situation. And I can assure you that, um, you know, we won't debate, you know, the, uh, the, the issue uh, any more than say that a lot of what occurs and the educational experience that makes a, a university degree that leads to a well-rounded person occurs because of uh, social interactions that occur on campus. I can tell you that uh, I think uh, part of what you're getting at is that I think you're going to see on the other side of this more balance between online and face-to-face -face education. Uh, we're already uh, preparing for that. There's not a single university in this country that's not thinking about that. But I do believe our face-to-face -face model will continue to be the dominant model, particularly when you're talking about the education of 18 to 22-year-olds. Uh, there is something critically important about that. We were forced to go online because we had to have some continuity and delivering on that education that we promised our students. But now let me address your perspective about tuition, because I think the perspective is one that is held by a lot of folks, but let me kind of help unpack that for you a bit. This university has made a top priority of keeping educational accessible and affordable. We created something called the Illinois Commitment, where if you're from a family that makes $67,100 or less, you attend the university tuition free. And that program we rolled out last year resulted in about a third of our students qualifying for free tuition. So when we talk about charging tuition to first year students, as we were talking about this year, um, that's not applicable for almost a third of our students because they're attending tuition free. And uh, our tuition is, yes, uh, one of the highest in the peer groups. But I can tell you that's the sticker price is not what the majority, 60 or more percent of our students pay, uh, pay. And I also think it's one of the best kept secrets that more than 50 percent of our students graduate from this university with zero debt. And the rest that do graduate with debt on average is about 23, 24,000. And I can tell you 23 to $24,000 is a small price to pay for a world-class education from a world-class institution that is clearly demonstrated in its ability to change lives as you heard from Catherine and to lead to some of the most influential uh, innovators and decision makers in the world. So, um, I guess that's, let me just stop with that and uh, say that uh, the last time I checked, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know these folks that are being paid too much because I am part of a community that there's no, for the most part, there's no eight hour workday. People give of their time, their talents, their personal time 
because working at the University of Illinois is one of the most important, rewarding experience, and people respond that way each and every day, and I can tell you it has really been gratifying to see how they've responded in the middle of this crisis. So thank you for your question, Franklin. I appreciate it. Okay, Chancellor Jones, I think that is about all the time we have today. So we want to thank all of the callers who asked questions, and thanks to everybody who was able to join in and listen in. Chancellor, do you have any final words you'd like to share before we say goodbye? Um, other than to say, well, thank you all very much for uh, this opportunity uh, to have this dialogue. Uh, it is a, uh, a, a different kind of format, and it's gratifying to know that the University of Illinois Alumni Association rolled out this new tool. This is not a COVID-19 tool they're using. Uh, this is something that has come out of the uh, innovation from uh, – from Bill as the chairman of the board and Jen Delavu and their, their, her team, uh, and finding new ways to substantively engage our university community uh, using this technology. And so it's been, uh, it's been gratifying to have this opportunity. So thank you all so much for all that you do. Thanks for taking time out of your day. And stay safe. Take care of your own Thanks. safety as well as taking care of the safety of others. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chancellor Jones. We really appreciate your time. We know you're super, super busy right now. Once again, thank you to the University of Illinois Alumni Association for sponsoring this event. If you'd like to learn more about the University of Illinois Alumni Association, its virtual town hall series, or any other opportunities to connect with UIAA and fellow alumni, please visit www.illinoisalumni.org. And if you're waiting on, in line to ask a question, please stay on the line. You will be able to leave a message with your question or comment. This concludes today's town hall. Thank you so much for joining the conversation. Have a great afternoon. ILL. <laughs>